Okay, let's begin. I want to welcome everyone to this event on fact checking hosted by the Northwest Science Writers Association. I'm Wade Gibbs, uh, current president of NSWA. And in addition to our regular members tonight, we're joined by many science writers from other parts of the country. We're glad you've chosen, chosen to spend uh, some of your evening with us. Tonight's event is being recorded and it will be available afterwards on our website, which is nwscience.org by next week. So if you have friends, colleagues who wanted to attend but couldn't, uh, go ahead and aim them at that web page and they'll be able to, to just watch it later. Uh, the Northwest Science Writers Association acknowledges with respect and gratitude that our members across the Pacific Northwest live on territories that have been the homelands of native peoples for thousands of years. I'm speaking to you now from Kirkland, Washington, which is within the homelands of the Duwamish, Stiligwamish, and Coast Salish peoples. I encourage you all to learn about the history of native <clears throat> ownership of the lands where you live and work. And two useful use resources for this are native-land.ca and nativegov.org. So as we get started here, I'm gonna throw up a quick survey to get a sense of our audience. So for those who are not already um, NSWA members, I'll quickly mention that our association supports science communication in all its many forms through events, writing awards, professional development grants, a mentorship program, which is now open for applications for 2021, um, an annual holiday party. Uh, many of you may have uh, had the joy of attending the February extra large holiday party we threw last February at the Burke Science Museum, Natural History Museum, I should say. Um, our next annual, annual member meeting and holiday party is January 7th, uh, 2021. And at that, we will be announcing the winners of the Best of the Northwest Science Writing Awards competition, which we are hosting now in its second year. Um, membership in NSWA is just $30 a year for professionals. It's $20 for students. And we currently have a $1 hardship membership, membership option for those who are affected by the economic upheaval this year. You can join, sign up for our newsletter, or check out our event calendar at nwscience.org. And on Facebook, you can find us at nwscience. At, on Twitter, our handle is uh, NSWA, and S-W-A. So with that, I'd like to um, thank James Gaines and Eric Sigliano, our board members who put this event together and hand it off to James to take it away from here. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. So as Waite just said, my name is James Gaines. I'm one of the board members of the Northwest Science Writers Association. Um, and I'm really excited to present this tonight. Uh, so, and I'll be the moderator tonight. So I'll be the person asking questions and um, introducing the speakers. So the bedrock of all nonfiction writing really boils down to this. Whatever the subject, the writer must prevent, present events, thoughts, and matters accurately. Writers and reporters and authors strive to do this, of course, but many magazines, publishing houses, and other outlets add an extra layer of certainty to this process by employing in-house or independent fact checkers. This process, which can be so intimately tied to the craft, often goes on somewhat behind the scenes. On the flip side, though, news reporters may actively be called upon to publicly verify or disprove the words of political or other notable figures, fact checking them as it were in public. So fact checking then is kind of part and parcel to everything we do as nonfiction writers, whether it be reportage, institutional writing or fact checking. Uh, that being said, how this actually works as both a job industry and mission isn't always clear. Luckily, we've lined up some excellent speakers for our talk tonight, which will hopefully uh, illuminate some of this. So our speakers tonight, uh, I'd like to introduce Emily Krieger. She is a fact checker, writer, and editor specializing in science and children's content. She began fact checking at National Geographic and has worked with other outlets as well as with book authors, such as David Quammen and Amber Mars. Meanwhile, have to correct. I'm sorry. Oh, Emma, go ahead. Emma Maris. Emma Maris. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> fact check. We're getting, yeah, fact check. We're getting <laughs> off to a good start. <laughs> Meanwhile, okay. David Mickelson. 
is the founder of the well-known fact-checking website Snopes, which he created in 1994 as a creative outlet for his interests, particularly around urban legends and folklore, I believe. Uh, since then, Snopes has grown uh, to cover everything from science to politics and is often a really go-to resource for people who want to get the scoop on what is actually happening. Finally, and I hope I said that last name correctly, <laughs> because apparently mispronouncing things is my thing. Uh, finally, we have Daniel Schlenoff, a uh, contributing editor and until recently senior copy editor and fact check boss at Scientific American, overseeing its fact check operations. Uh, Daniel also wrote its Reckoning with Our Mistakes article, which was a pretty eye opening critique, uh, self critique of the biases and blind spots in Scientific American's long 175 year history. Uh, so as you can see, I hope we've assembled a star-studded panel. Uh, say hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, and Dan, uh, would you prefer Daniel or Dan? Dan's better. All right. Sounds good. All right. So to quickly go over the plan for everybody. Uh, so the idea for tonight is that we'll have about 45 minutes of a panel discussion. This will be questions that were presented by me to our panelists who will then discuss it. Uh, we'll try to hit questions on both how the job of a fact checker works, as well as some larger big picture questions about things like what is truth, how to address misinformation, that kind of thing. Uh, this will then be followed by about a half hour of audience Q&A. Um, if you have any questions for the panel or any points to raise, uh, you can enter them into the Q&A panel, which is a button that should be visible at the bottom of your Zoom link or of your Zoom window. Okay, with that all out of the way, without further ado is panelists, are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Okay, so maybe let's start off with kind of a very basic question. For somebody who is interested in working as a fact checker, how do fact checkers get work? How do you set rates and how do you set yourself up as a fact checker specifically? Well, I guess if I jump in, since uh, it's, <laughs> it sounds like it's kind of hard for me to answer that because I created my own job uh, <laughs> before some of this was really a thing. Um, you know, we, we employ at Snopes, uh, I guess we employ about 24 people now, uh, not all of them fact checkers. Um, and there are a number of fact checking organizations like ours that hire people. Uh, we're a little unique in this space in that we're neither a nonprofit nor are we an arm of a much larger news organization like you know Washington Post or Associated Press. Um, so you know, I can't really tell you much about the process of, of getting work as a fact checker in, you know, for fact checking organizations other than they're out there. Uh, some of them advertise on their own websites or, you know, on other uh, platforms like LinkedIn and, you know, go and look for them. I can jump in next. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I learned how to fact check. 20 years ago at National Geographic and, and a couple different divisions. So I feel lucky that I got that kind of mentorship and deep dive into fact checking. And um, the people who taught me were uh, two women, Pat Kellogg and Abby Tipton, who had been on the magazine's fact checking staff for a long time. And um, they, uh, I was paired up with them on stories um, and we walked through them together so I could see what kinds of statements they were flagging to be checked. And um, just, we got to talk through the thought processes. Um, and that was extremely helpful having that one on one mentorship. And, um, you know, I think we did that for two or three stories. And the one-on-one, -on -one, I really stress if you can reach out to somebody and see if they would be interested in mentoring you or just answering questions via DMs on Twitter or whatever, because um, there are a lot of great places you can go to uh, educate yourself on how, you know, fact-checking basics, but there are, and it seems increasingly in my experience, a lot of um, 
trickier grayer areas that um, I think are best discussed with another person. And so it's nice to um, just kind of have someone or a team that you can call up and say, hey, this issue came up, how would you handle this? Or what does it not seem like to you? And um, anyway, I'm trying to answer three different questions as quickly <laughs> as I can. So I'll move on then to, um, I think you asked too how we, how a fact checker, how you can get fact checking work, is that right? Yeah, so I understand, I know that you're a freelancer, right? So yeah. you have a couple of different fact checking clients. Yes, so I left National Geographic, uh, long story short, moved to Seattle, became a freelancer because of that, I don't know what I wanna do. I'll be a freelancer and see what happens. And um, I ended up fact checking stories for National Geographic Magazine. And I got that gig obviously because they knew I was moving to Seattle. And I said, hey, would you guys ever wanna hire somebody as a freelance fact checker for some of your articles? And they said, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so that was a pretty, organic and easy way to pick up some freelance fact checking work. And then uh, one of the people who, so David Quammen, I fact checked a article in National Geographic magazine. Uh, I fact checked his, was Darwin wrong? And um, he remembered that. And uh, we worked together again, fact checking his uh, zoonotic diseases article for National Geographic magazine. And Years went by and I had sent him an email when I went freelance saying, hey, I'm gonna, I'm looking for writing, editing, fact checking work. If, if, you know, if you have a book or anything comes up and you think you could use some help, let me know. And lo and behold, he got in touch and said, oh, I'm writing a book on zoonotic diseases and you were the fact checker on that magazine article and you have that background. Um, so would you be interested in fact checking the book? And it was exciting and it also blew my mind and was scary because I thought, oh my gosh, how do you fact check a book? I've never fact checked a book before. Um, so all of this to say, it's a lot of word of mouth and um, just letting people know that I was available for work and looking for fact checking work and had a fact checking background. And honestly, it seems like more and more people in the last decade have been looking to hire fact checkers, which is exciting and great, it seems. So <clears throat> probably my turn to jump in here. And I would say that um, when I started fact checking 30 years ago, um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a common thing for somebody to just start fact checking. Um, and I don't think it is now. I think people who fact check get into the business because they work as journalists or proofreaders. I really started in the copy department at Scientific American as a proofreader. And as time went on, very quickly, I started getting more and more um, responsibilities, uh, including fact checking and then copy editing. So I think um, probably the uh, best qualifications for a fact checker are any kind of journalist skills, um, although in the past we have hired fact checkers who um, have worked at museums, at educational institutions, um, anybody who has a kind of facility with information, manipulating information, um, trying to ascertain whether the information is correct. Um, so if you check columns of figures or pages or statements uh, for somebody else, um, you know, then that's exactly what you kind of need to do for fact checking. And the, uh, the, the value of fact checking um, is something that you have to sort of bring to it, that you have to um, look at what the writer has created um, and not try and second guess them, but try and sort of figure out, you know, where they got the information from, uh, what it needs to kind of uh, be as accurate as possible because any journalist or writer, um, you know, the kinds of information that you need to include in fact checking, um, or at least in an article, uh, the writer, you know, will make it a, a valiant attempt to get all that information into an article. And sometimes, you know, there are things that just escape notice or um, that you know, it helps to have a second opinion, somebody saying, you know, and more than just the editor, 
somebody saying, here's what we need, or what about this question? And this question came up, you know, did you talk to this person? So uh, <clears throat> in a way, fact checking is, uh, it's really part of the creation of anything written. Um, and I think magazines and books are probably pretty similar. I've also fact checked uh, videos um, and it's the same thing. Just find out what the information is that they're trying to communicate and ensure that it is correct. Great, thank you so much. So it sounds like this is kind of similar to much of writing and journalism in that it's partly creating your own work. It's partly connections and reaching out to people who you have worked with and partly uh, working with people with uh, your leveraging your skills and expertise. Um, so maybe to move on to another question, um, let's talk about the role of a fact checker. Um, one of the things is that fact checkers are often part of a team when they're working behind the scenes with an editor or a, and a reporter. Um, so where should the lines be between a fact checker, editor, and reporter? And for David, I know that this is a little different when you're writing a public fact check. So in that case, uh, if you want to jump in, you should feel free to um, let Emily and Dan take this if you want. But uh, on your side of things, is there a line between f a fact checker and more typical reportage? And I bundled into this, have you been, ever been in a situation, any of you, where you feel like a line has been blurry or been crossed? Uh, uh, well, before Emily and, and Dan jump in, because it's more relevant to them, yeah, I'd say kind of what we do at Snopes is, is somewhat different because we are reactive rather than proactive, right? We're only fact-checking information that's already out there. We're not, you know, for the most part, reporters. We're not working with reporters. We're just, you know, reacting to stuff that's you know out on Facebook, the you know, articles that have already been published to what public figures say um, and sort of fact checking it after the fact rather than pre-publication. Um, so, you know, we have, of course we have writers, we have editors, but there's not really much of a blurring there. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll let Emily and Dan address that better. Um, I, I can go. So I have been a writer and an editor and a fact checker, most, most often a fact checker and a writer. Um, and I guess generally speaking, the way I approach a story, let's say a magazine article, is, um, you know, the editor is there to help shepherd it and shape it. And um, the reporter is to me, it's obviously their story and it's ultimately they have the ownership of that story. And I, as the fact checker, am there to, in a way, I, so I think of myself as both supporting the reporter and those being reported on, you know, be they animals, mushrooms or people, whatever. Um, and I want to make sure that whatever the subject is, the reporter has honored it um, accurately and fairly and respectfully. And so that's, that, that's and, and obviously that also, those are things that the, that the editor and the reporter would be aiming for too. But um, I would say the only time that the lines have been blurred in my experience and I found it frustrating and inappropriate was, um, when sometimes, and I'm having to fill in a lot of gaps here and make guesses of what happened in the chain of command during the process, you know, because oftentimes the fact checker comes in quite late at the end of the process. And so you don't always know what was happening earlier on, but I, I have seen on a few occasions where, because there are so many fact check changes, which is not the fact checker's fault, or, um, and or so many changes by the editor that a reporter just kind of backs away silently from the story and starts to cede ownership of it. I see you laughing, Dan. Yeah. You must be familiar with this. And when that happens, it gets really not good because 
uh, if the reporter is kind of backing away from the story and starting to get squeamish about making calls on changing language, you know, okay, we can't say it, but it, how it, it can't say as it's written now. So, you know, what are, what can we rewrite, rewrite it to say? If, if it seems like a reporter is kind of backing away from taking that responsibility and that interest and that ownership and that help in solving problems that gets, then that feels like, um, you know, scope creep for me and it gets confusing for the whole team. So I, I think that's the only thing I can think of where um, the line has been blurred and it was not good for the story or the, or the team. <clears throat> I would echo uh, one particular word that you said, which is supporting, which is that the fact checker is um, at least in Scientific American is first and foremost part of a team. Uh, by the time an article kind of comes to the fact checker, um, it's really, it's been through an editor, a top editor, um, you know, I may copy edit it and fact check it, or we may split those duties up, have one person fact check it and one person copy edit it. But everybody has to kind of be very supportive of everybody else because um, you have to trust that the person you're working with is doing their very best to make the story as best that it can be. And yes, I was laughing because I, I do remember one senior writer, um, a fellow by the name of Philip Morrison, who wrote a book review. And uh, the fact checker, I mean, he was a very um, smart fellow, but, you know, sometimes he just, he went overboard and he, he sent back this monumental list of questions on a book review. And, you know, the sort of slightly acerbic reply from Philip Morrison was, you know, thank the fact checker for his uh, Talmudic list of questions <laughs> um, because they were so detailed and so intricate. And, you know, you have to, you do have to sort of step back a little bit and let the writer be the writer and let the editor be the editor and let the top editor do, do what the top editor needs to do. And, you know, yes, there are times when you can kind of step out of that lane a little bit and say, well, you know, the way this project is shaping up in, you know, for instance, if we're writing about, um, you know, some physics problem, we can say, well, you know, the latest papers sort of say this or that, and maybe we want to go back to the author and just ask them about that, or maybe um, we can at least mention these two things. And so, you know, often there's a kind of collaboration uh, about what actually gets published. And, uh, you know, I, I, I understand the question and, um, there isn't any hard and fast rule that says, no, you can't say that or do that. Um, no, the editor can't say that or do that. No, the writer is forbidden from doing this. No, you know, everybody's always sort of working on these things at the same time. And usually under a fantastically um, pressurized deadline uh, driven environment. So you, you have to all work together to get this thing out. Uh, but you also have to have a lot of respect for the writer and the people you're working with and allow them to do what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I, you know, I think some people's just gauging from what people say to me in passing about fact checking in general, what their impressions are. It seems like people can tend to be afraid of it and think of it as maybe like a combative experience or exercise. But I don't think of it that way. And that's not my experience. Typically, um, it's, it's really, it is such a supportive, it's such a supportive job. I think you really are there to, to serve the subject of the story, the, the reporter, you know, the, the publication and, um, and the facts. And so, yeah, I feel like when done well, it should feel more like a supportive nurturing experience for the whole time. That's quite different for us. <laughs> quite often, the <laughs> subjects we're dealing with are quite combative about trying, you know, having to answer questions that we're posing to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's so, you know, and just thinking about fact checking more in preparation for this, um, I just real, I just appreciate even more how many different kinds of fact checking there are now, and how many different scenarios and formats and skill sets and yeah it's you know truth k full-time job <laughs> yeah uh speaking of truth decay maybe look, we'll put aside some of the methodology for a second and talk about a big picture question 
Uh, so this one I'm interested in seeing if you have opinions on. So in the past few years, we've been seeing either growing concerns or more publicly voiced concerns that formerly fairly solid sources like say the CDC or the EPA uh, may no longer be completely trustworthy when it comes to the information they're putting out. How should fact checkers reckon with possibly compromised or biased data from these large sources? So you're posing the question specifically about times when they may not be correct rather than public perception of them being incorrect even when they aren't? Or? Well, I suppose one of the things I'm interested in is, is that something that fact checkers should take into consideration if people are worried that certain sources are no longer uh, as trustworthy when it comes to uh, factual accuracy? Mm. Well, I think those of us who are old enough to remember when the internet started, so to speak, <laughs> um, you know, it, it was kind of touted as, you know, sort of a, a, a liberating force, right? We'd no longer have to deal with these middlemen when you wanted to buy airline tickets or buy and sell stocks, or maybe if you were a musician, you know, get your music out to the public. And there wasn't really a lot of talk about how a lot of times those middlemen or gatekeepers served really useful functions like journalists <laughs> being, being the gatekeeper between just raw information that everybody can post on the internet and you know the audience being someone to sift through and determine what's credible and what's newsworthy. And so I think that kind of We've kind of leveled the playing field to our detriment, where the, some even agencies like the CDC are competing with everyone from the president of the United States to your crazy uncle Larry telling you that they're not trustworthy. Uh, there's no pandemic. It's really it's just like the flu, and you know we are all struggling with kind of how do we kind of undo that. Um, yeah, in some ways, I feel like I'm horribly ill prepared to answer the question of why do people not seem to care as much or as they should about accuracy? Because, I mean, as a fact checker, I obviously care about accuracy and I'm curious. And so it's difficult for me. It has been very difficult for me this year to wrap my head around. Um, why don't people care? about other people lying, especially the president. And uh, what does that mean? And how does fact checking fit into all of this? And, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to read articles and educate myself on thinking and, you know, human behavior. But um, so I'm on deck to fact check a book about COVID-19 that David Quammen is writing or not, he's not writing it yet, he's researching it. And the CDC data, a lot of data, I'm just, these are questions that have come up uh, recently and I'm, and I don't know the answer to the question. I just know that I need to be aware that there are increasingly more compromised sources and data that um, I didn't worry about as much prior. And, you know, I don't know how to reflect that in reporting, and I and I don't even know how compromised the data is yet. You know, how, how do we even know? So we're in the midst of this, and we're trying to figure out. And I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I, if you if you can't trust the CDC's data, what do you do? That's a good question. And I hope people are talking about that other than than just us tonight and trying to figure out a way to address that. Um, uh, it's it's kind of like a. Um... Oh, there's a word for it. It's kind of like a loss of branding. I mean, I know everyone yeah. everyone likes to uh, you know, harp on social media as the great evil, but just in a very broad sense, if you think, you know, most people or a lot of people are getting information from social media, but what do you see there? You see things that your, your friends, your relatives, your coworkers are posting. You're getting articles from various sources based on what you previously read and the kinds of things you buy. It's kind of like the equivalent of going to a newsstand and instead of say reading, you know, 
uh, Time magazine from front to back, somebody's handing you 25 articles torn from 25 different publications, and you don't know which ones they came from or why they're giving them to you, and trying to make sense, you know, the average person trying to make sense out of which of these should I pay attention to, which are credible, which are not. You know, it, it's extremely difficult. It, it's kind of, I said, the, the playing field's been leveled. It's not that the CDC is, isn't trustworthy, it's that we've given voice to all these people who want to shout and claim that they aren't. And those are the people who are not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Oh, I think oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I would also point out that anybody who works in the science field, um, however long you've worked in the science field, there are always going to be subjects uh, such as evolution or climate change um, that have quite a long history, certainly for evolution that's been going on since 1859, have a very long history of um, certain people just fighting as hard as they possibly could to denigrate any um, authoritative source uh, on the subjects. So you have to look at who is saying what. And, and that's a very good point about having 25 articles from 25 magazines, because you do have to sort of look at what is this data that I am being presented with and how do we know it's accurate? I would say that um, if you're collecting data from peer reviewed published, pub published um, articles, that's a pretty good source. Although as we know from the retracted article in the Lancet about how uh, vaccines are causing autism, um, those articles in and of themselves are not the be all and end all of accuracy. Uh, but you can say, all right, well, if I look at articles from these 10 journals, all of which seem to be peer reviewed and fairly sensible, and they all say the same thing, well, then that's pretty, pretty certain. Um, and with respect to the CDC, I mean, they don't, um, you know, that the people who are trying to say that the CDC is not a good source, you know, they don't have uh, data to back up a lot of what they're saying. You know, the CDC, when they say something, it's usually based on scientific studies. So you can look at the scientific studies and you can say, well, how likely is it that this scientific study is just a fraud? And, you know, I suppose if you're very paranoid, all right, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, you know, you can say, sure, you know, Stanford University may be part of the deep state. I don't know. You know, you can make up any conspiracy story. But, you know, for a sensible, reasonable person, you know, you can look and say, here's where the data is. Here's who did it. Here's and here's what it concludes. Yeah, it's kind of another phenomenon that uh, the online world has exacerbated to some extent is that you know, a lot of our audience is not good at distinguishing this is a you know this is something that was published in a peer-reviewed journal versus this was not peer-reviewed or this is in a basically a paper publish uh, journal or you know even learning that just because somebody writes something and formats it as a PDF and sticks it up on the internet does not make it a study. It can just be someone's conjecture and opinion and it looks like a study because they call it that sometimes or a report or something that there's all, just a lot of junk out there that people would not be stumbling across if we were still living in the print world. Well, maybe that answers uh, one of the main questions of what journalists and fact checkers and editors do, which is they do sort out that from that morass of material, what's important, what's viable. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think we all know it's, um, it's a mountain to sift through and it's exhausting on purpose too. <laughs> yes, that's true. So, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> It's an assault right now, and so yeah, when you when you hear things about the CDC data, then you have to question who's saying that about the CDC data. And one thing I always find myself asking is, okay, who benefits from this? Who would benefit from this? And just mm -hmm. trying to gauge the various perspectives, and it's 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 just something that has really come to the foreground in my mind this year, and being uh, hyper 
critical of sources and um, just really thinking about truth more and sources, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not to get too meta and the matrix and all that, but it's been a pretty weird year. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. We've also kind of seen the rise of uh, sort of faux fact checking. Um, like we had the, uh, there's the Standing Rock controversy going on with the pipeline, and there was a uh, like a Standing Rock f FAQ, you know, FAQ website set up with you know questions and answers, and of course it was actually being run by a public relations company hired by the pipeline company, and it was not in any sense a you know an objective or impartial source of information. You know, so it even extends to our realm. You know, people can call themselves fact checkers, but are they really? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. very, that's very meta. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that I've been thinking a lot this year is I, I don't, I'm questioning a lot this year, like, whew, but I don't think that uh, the truth decay, as we'll call it, that we've seen, especially this year, and the fact that fact checking in publications online, what have you, is is it's not it's a more murky gray area, right? Than um, being a writer, a reporter, or an editor. Fact fact checkers, it's like yeah, I kind of know that's going on. It seems like more the last ten years. It's different from place to place. Maybe the copy editor does it. Maybe a fellow does it. Maybe an actual staff fact checker is the only person who does it. I do think just basically, you know, shining a light wherever we can on processes and being transparent about what is fact checking? When is it done? Who is doing it? Who are these people who are fact checkers who are being big gatekeepers of knowledge, right? And, and a lot of the times it's unclear if a publication or a website has fact checkers or who those fact checkers are, you know, are they interns? Are they paid? Are they trained? And um, it, it, to me, I find myself thinking a lot, it would be nice if fact-checking were more formally incorporated into the editorial process, um, like mm -hmm. editing and writing are obviously not all stories. Um, not all articles need to be fact-checked, but uh, you know, where appropriate. Um, I think that would be really helpful to just kind of as a field and maybe as a culture saying, this is fact-checking. You write the story, you edit the story, you fact check the story. It's just as important that the story is, ac is accurate. And as a field, we decide that and we show our society and our, our culture that fact checking is important to us and we're formalizing it and we're incorporating it. And we're going to pay fact checkers more on par with editors and um, writers. And we're going to list the fact checkers name. And if you write a book, and you pay somebody from your advance thousands of dollars to fact check your book, which a lot of people don't, I think that's great. And you should get something like, I think Emma Maris and Michelle Nyhaus and I were emailing and somebody suggested a gold sticker that says this book was professionally fact checked, you know, and that's that's a value and an asset. And I'm kind of going on a, on a ramp, but I do think that making fact checking less kind of in the shadows uh, and the editorial and publication process has a connection to how much we value as a society truth and transparency. And so I hope that those two things can kind of coalesce and feed off of each other in a good way in the coming years. I actually find it interesting, actually fascinating that you are fact checking a book on a topic that is so controversial right now. <laughs> it hasn't been written yet, so we'll see, right? Oh, well, it'll, do, it'll be a doozy, right? Yeah. It's. I mean, it's a. It's a such a moving target, and yeah, I don't know how you do that. So, I'm glad I'm not David Quammen right now. I guess <laughs> <laughs> he's got his work cut out for him, but he can do it. I know it. So yeah, uh, I don't know. That'll be interesting seeing how different the sources may be for that book or the different kinds of questions that may come up or new questions. Yeah. Or not. You said his book was on COVID, right? Yes. That it has been a really fascinating topic just because of how much is unknown, how much is from anecdotal sources, 
or preprints, and then there's misinformation and outright disinformation. I think that could be a panel all of its own of just addressing how did fact checking do this year in covering the pandemic. But we might have to save that for another time. We're coming up around 645, which is when we start to get into the Q&A section. So maybe before we do that, if you have any quick things that you want to say about fact checking that you would like to see change or things that you think are going particularly interesting in the industry right now, we can leave on a couple quick notes if you have them, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. And if you don't, then we'll just go ahead and, and move on over. <laughs> I'll jump in and say, I, I would like to know who are fact checkers? Why is it so hard to find us? And um, I, I do feel like when I try to find other fact checkers, it's kind of this disparate experience. And there are, there are several really great organizations like Pointers and the, I think it's called the International Fact Checking Network. And then um, obviously uh, the KSJ. Um, which I wanted to say, so if you're wondering, how do I find a fact checker? Who's a fact checker? Um, so the KSJ site soon, sometime this month probably, is going to have a public fact checker database. And so you can find a fact checker. And I think you can also, through the website, um, send them a note and say, hey, I would like to be in this database. And here's my information. So I think that's an awesome step um, toward formalizing and kind of coalescing things hopefully a little bit more in fact checking and um, I'm excited about that and I hope that everybody who's listening checks it out and you can find out when it's up by following um, KSJ on Twitter or Brooke Burrell. And that would be the night science journalism program at, at MIT right? Yeah. All right I'm going to drop a link to that in the chat. All right well Dan or David is there anything else you want to add real quick or should we jump on over to the Q&A section? Let's, well, I think we should jump to the Q&A. Yeah. All right. Come on now. Yeah. That sounds great. All right, then let's go with, uh, so this is a question that is for the panelists from Bryn Nelson. Um, so what is the single most important thing that writers should do at or near the beginning of the writing process to make the fact checking process easier? And I believe that would be with regards to more editorial fact checking. Just keep noting sources. Um, you, you don't have to be maniacal about it, but you just have to be kind of careful about if you're going to start talking about something, you know, you just, where you get your data from, where you get your information, just note it down. Um, and if it's a paper or if it's an interview, just write it down. Yeah, what Dan said, it's so it's so hard to go back a year or months later and try to remember where mm -hmm. we got something from. And it's so frustrating too, I know for reporters. Um, Cause you don't wanna get rid of something that you have this like, oh, I feel like I got this from a really good source and I don't wanna pitch it, but I just can't find it. So yeah, just like what Dan said, keep track. Yeah, our process is a little different, but uh, sometimes I find myself in that boat if you're, you're writing a really, involved fact check and cited 20 different articles and it's like you know, don't want to have to go through at the end and try and you know pick them all back out of my article and, and follow the hyperlinks and note down the information it's kind of like it's a lot easier if you kind of keep that information as you go along and mm -hmm. not, really not have to put it together afterwards great so i think uh moving on from there um, this is a question that came up very early in the Q&A, and so I wanted to make sure we have time to address it. Um, but the Writers Co-op asks, how do you all handle liability? Uh, this question specifically for freelance fact checking. So I think, Emily, you might be the best person to answer this, but anybody should feel free to jump in. Um, do you purchase your own liability? And I believe that would be liability insurance. And if so, who covers fact checkers? Do you negotiate for you to be put on the client's legal umbrella, et cetera? Um, I don't have liability insurance and I've never really felt like I needed it. It seems like one of the things kind of like dental insurance where every three years I think, should, should I have this? 
And I look at it and I think about who my clients are and what I'm typically fact checking and I just, I decline it. Um, but I think that it depends probably on what you're fact checking and um, what kind of arrangements you might have in your contract if it's with um, a publication. And I'm thinking indemnity, indemnity in particular. Um, but I do know that um, if you are interested in learning about the liability insurance that's out there and what your options are, um, you can go to the Writers Co-op. I think they have a webinar recently. Um, because it is, especially as things get more contentious and uh, sticky, it is something to consider and check in on and think about. Um, and have frank discussions with your clients if you're feeling nervous about something or like something is unclear. Um, and also in my experience at publications and some publishing houses, there are lawyers that review and vet manuscripts and flag all legal, um, legally dicey areas, I guess. And so it's good to check in with your editor and find out if that's happening and, and just have the conversations and ask the questions and make sure everybody's comfortable and things are clear, I guess. But I don't personally have liability insurance. I may have to revisit that in 2021. 20, <laughs> <laughs> kind so, of an, I was gonna say it's kind of an interesting legal question. I guess if you're sort of like a, a literary fact checker, you know, is if something goes awry, is, is the liability with the the writer and or publisher rather than yeah. you? Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, we're we're directly responsible because we publish our material ourselves. So of course we have a policy, you know, that covers you know, our our organization as a whole. But I will say, despite all the years we've been doing this and the thousands of articles we've written, we have never actually been sued <laughs> over anything we've published. You know, you know, we get lots of contentious threats, but uh, never been sued. That's no. because it was all true, right? What you said. Yeah. <laughs> That's the beauty. Of that. <laughs> well, there's, there's, yeah. Um, Scientific American has a. We're quite lucky that we had. A legal expert. Um, so the magazine is actually part of Springer Nature Publishing, which is a giant organization, and they have an in-house legal counsel. So it's up to the fact checker, though, to look at something and try and figure out if it should be run by the legal people. And that's actually pretty easy. It's whenever you're talking about a person or a company and saying, well, this person or this company did especially companies did very bad things because of this or that. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty good indication that it should be run by the legal people. And very little happens except that the lawyer will look at it and say, well, we just have to write, you know, according to some sources or this may be, or, you know, just put in a few more weasel words as far as I can tell that's uh, the grand result of all this. But it's, it is important to um, think about who might be really offended by this. I mean, it's one thing if you're writing about something quite innocuous, but uh, you know, if you're writing about COVID or if you're a Snopes, <laughs> everything you write is pretty much controversial. Um, you know, we, we had, you know, we, the magazine, Scientific American writes articles on, on fat, fracking and you know, all these big companies, you know, we were especially careful when it came to uh, Union Carbide and Bhopal and things like that. So um, that's probably an older reference than most of you will know, but never mind. Uh, it's, um, but the, the upshot is that you do want to be a little bit careful about who might object to this and if so, on what grounds. And, um, the liability, I, I do remember the magazine was actually sued. And I don't know how much I can actually kind of go into this, but I will say that there was a caption that was added during the process, kind of at the last minute, that didn't really go by anybody else. Um, you know, this individual just kind of added this caption and we published the magazine and the people that we offended were highly offended and they sued us. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't actually ever informed as to what happened. Um, uh, to that lawsuit, but you know, part of it is just 
um, look at everything that gets published and have that in the back of your mind, along with everything else that you have in the back of your mind, uh, who, who are you going to annoy? Mm -hmm. And in addition to annoy, upset, I've, I've dealt with um, talk, calling some sources about some really sensitive subjects, um, tragedies, you know, and just making sure extra, extra care that this story is thoughtfully and as accurately as possible, respectfully portrayed, you know, mm -hmm. I, I had that come up a couple times as a different angle. Well, great. Well, thanks for answering those questions. So maybe let's move on. So Ellen Kuwaner wants to know, can you speak to the pay range for fact checkers? Is it per hour, per page? I never know as a copy editor how dense the text is going to be until I get into it. So I charge by the hour. I do a lot of fact checking as a copy editor. Uh, so yeah, how? Uh, what is the pay range when you're a fact checker? Well, when you're on staff, it's much easier, but um, that's probably something that Emily would be able to answer. Um, although I can say that from the point of view of the employer, when Scientific American employs fact checkers, uh, specifically fact checkers, we always pay them by the hour. Is there a cap on your hours? <laughs> uh, so that's a really good question. Um, you know, technically there isn't, but Obviously, if somebody spends a hundred hours to fact check a, you know, four four hundred word news story, we would never use that person again, unless there was a really really good reason. Um, nobody ever has spent that much time, um, but uh, that's a that's a um, that's not really sort of hmm, that's a difficult question to answer because, you know, to some extent some things just take longer you know some things are fairly simple but yeah it's like if there's a reason that it's taking a lot of time you know i had to consult you know 18 different sources and uh the data was very tangled i mean we do um we farm out fact checking for news stories mostly so in a way that's a little bit more um it's a little easier to kind of uh keep track of in the sense of who's doing what and how long they've taken on it? Um, yeah, I, I charge by the hour when I fact check books because a book is a book and you don't know what's in that book until you get going. And I always ask for a sample chapter with annotations, if at all possible, because not just the text, uh, the number of facts, the type of facts, but also um, what are your annotations like? You know, that's going to give me a good idea, a better, a better idea of how long this is going to take me and then give you a better estimate, um, a more accurate estimate, if you will, hopefully our estimate range. Um, so yeah, I, books, books, I charge by the hour. And um, basically I have conversations with clients and I have a no rabbit holes policy, so I don't go down any rabbit holes. Um, I let you know th where I'm at after five, 10 minutes on something and leave a note. And if you want me to go down that path further, I will, but you know, it's their money and they're paying by the hour and they may just say, you know what, forget it. I don't care that much, cut it. Um, so yeah, it would, I think it would be very difficult to do a project for a book unless you really allowed unless you really insured for a lot of scope creep and you had a lot of I don't know so yeah it you know I fact so I fact checked a lot of books now over 10 years and the hourly rate seems to work well um and I I looked at my books that I have fact checked in full because sometimes I fact check them just you know a few chapters or a section um, but for books that I fact checked in full, and they were typically, they were about, you know, like 80,000 word books, um, took anywhere from 50 hours to 200 hours. And it depends on, you know, the author's budget, the number of facts, the type of facts, whether or not they were going to be checking, wanting me to check quotes, which is a whole other 
subject. Um, so yeah, there's just so many variables um, and, and figuring out what is important to the client. And if they're coming to you really late in the game, which sometimes they are, um, triaging what is most important, what is most critical that we make sure we get eyeballs on and check in this story. Um, so I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> I mean, so one for, thing us, I was gonna say, for us, all of our fact checkers are full-time employees who are salaried. So as far as the range, I'll just say, if you know what journalists typically make, I'd say we pay quite competitively with good benefits. Great. I was going to ask, um, I understand money can be a little hard to talk about if there were um, ranges that you had heard of or knew were typical for this kind of fact checking, um, such as what a typical author might budget out for a book project um, or what uh, um, you, ex you would expect to see people uh, charging. But uh, again, I understand that money is sometimes hard to talk about. I'll tell you how much I charge. I think that's what people want to know in part, right? So I charge $70 an hour uh, when I fact check books and um, I keep the clients apprised of how things are going. If things are significantly slowing down or speeding up, I let them know. Um, and sometimes the clients want me to follow up on things or they want me to read the revised language and ask some questions about it. And so that's additional time to, um, but yeah, I charge $70 an hour when I fact check books. I charge $70 an hour when I fact check articles for publications. Sometimes those article, sometimes those publications uh, don't wanna pay me $70 an hour, they wanna pay me less. And so then we try to come to an agreement on a project fee that feels fair to me and um, sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't as everybody who has had a project fee can tell you for a story because like we've all said, you know, you just don't know till you know and it, it takes as long as, it's, as it takes. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I think hourly is fair and project fee, you just gotta trust each other. You gotta really trust each other and feel comfortable going to your client and saying, hey, the scope is really creeping if that starts to happen. You know, you don't wanna, you gotta be able to communicate with each other and feel like you both got a fair deal at the end, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's expensive. That's more than Scientific American pays their freelancers. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one reason why I fact check books is because people one-on-one -on -one can, can and do pay me more than mm. publications. And right. people one-on-one -on -one pay me faster than publications and with vastly less problems. And people give me feedback one-on-one -on -one about um, the changes that I make. Right. More in general, I would say, than publications. Um, but there are conversations with publications, but yes. Um, and that is what I mean when I say, I would like to see fact checkers at publications. Why, why are they paid at some publications so much less than the editors and the reporters. There's really nothing you can tell me as a fact checker that's gonna make me feel okay about that because it's in the numbers, right? It's like, yeah. eh, we value you here, you here, you here, whatever it is. And I would like to feel like as a field, journalism values fact checking more and see that reflected in the pay and the staffing at magazines and other publications. That said, I know everybody's struggling with money you know especially this year so everybody's budgets are difficult but i do think it sends a message and it would also i think attract more people to fact checking and more different types of people to fact checking which would only be good for it to diversify if it paid more of a livable wage for more people great well thank you so I'll mark that complete, and maybe we can go on to this question from Chris. Uh, how do you decide what sources to use for fact checking, and how do you get access to your sources? Mm -hmm. Sorry, oh, could you repeat their question again? Sorry, I, I heard the second part. Uh, how do you decide what sources to use for fact checking, and how do you gain access to your sources? That's a good question. The uh, it depends on 
what it is that you're fact checking. If it's um, an article that uses a lot of scientific sources, um, presumably then your sources are scientific papers. Of course, most freelance fact checkers won't have access to that. So um, if you are an editor, what you do is you ask the author to provide the kinds of backup that um, a fact checker can use. Um, but if it's, uh, if it's an article that deals more with uh, politics or who said what to whom, that's a lot harder. That I wouldn't actually be able to answer. Yeah, lots of different types of fact checking. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, that's I mean that's getting at the heart of fact checking, right? Like, who's a good source? Who do you trust? And as a, as a culture, or society, or country, or field. Um, how did we decide that these people or this organization is trustworthy? And um, as you know, it gets really sticky the more you dig into that. And, um, but I would say generally, you know, the big nonprofit, well-respected, um, long-time turn to organizations like CDC, WHO, UN, those are good places to start typically. And if you don't know, um, ask somebody that's in that field that your subject matter is, you know, who are the biggies in your field and who should I turn to and who's trusted and why and um, who, are, who are the people that, you know, are the rabble rousers that people say are providing disinformation and if, if you know that and um, yeah. I and a lot of it was just when I was being trained as a fact checker years ago. So I have a magazine journalism degree from 2000. I don't have any memory of getting any real kind of fact checking education in my journalism degree. Um, so the way I learned what's trustworthy, what are the big sites or what are the big organizations or the big people that we turn to was word of mouth and being trained one on one with those women at National Geographic and just talking to people. And, you know, I think as a fact checker, if you want to be a good fact checker and you want to be a helpful fact checker, you cannot be afraid to not know things and show people that you don't know things. You've got to be able to go to people and say, can you help me with this? Or who's the expert? Who should I ask about this? And, and tell people that you don't know things, you know, like, I don't understand this, or I don't know this. Um, you know, you're in this field. What, what do you recommend? Um, so just a willingness to ask questions and, you know, obviously to experts in their field. Um, I hope that helps answer the question. It, it, it depends so widely on what the subject is, right? Um, I don't know. It does, but I would also give a sort of slightly circular answer, which is that probably the best source for fact checking is what happens if your source is wrong? Are they somebody or an institution who would go back and say, you know what, we got this wrong, let's figure what, out what the right answer is. And if, if they do that, and that happens with a lot of institutions, not necessarily with people so much, um, certain people. So that may be a, you know, a good way of saying, if they get it wrong, do they correct themselves? Do they issue a correction? Yeah, I like that. Great, thank you so much. So uh, I have a, another question. So this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, and this is a couple of people have asked something similar. Um, they ask, can you walk us through the nuts and bolts process of how you fact check a sentence in a typical science news story? And I know we only have about eight minutes left. So this might have to be a little bit abridged. Um, but if you could speak to what a typical workflow looks like for actually fact-checking um, a piece of written work. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you look at, you look at each, you start by look, reading each sentence and anytime there's a statement of fact saying this is this, I mean, that's something that you have to check. And mm -hmm. I would advise don't take anything for granted because 
a lot of times the things that you think, oh, I know that, or that's in my wheelhouse. I've known that forever. Sometimes you go look it up and, oh, wow, that's actually not what I thought it was. So yeah, don't take anything for granted. Just it really is, is you go through and any, any statement of fact, you, you check it and uh, I'm trying to think how else to answer that question. I don't know. Help me out, Dan. I would, I would, I would, <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Um, anything you think you know, be skeptical of, um, especially if it's, if it says something like first or only, oh, or, yeah. you know, uh, oh, yeah, the first, no. the onlys. Yeah. yeah. You know, who was yeah. the first person to fly across the Atlantic Ocean? Well, it was Charles Lindbergh. No, it wasn't, you know, things like that. I was, if I can jump in, I was just talking to somebody about superlatives being particularly tricky. If somebody says yeah. the biggest or the best or the most important and just being yeah. like, those are so hard to yeah. judge. Yeah, and absolutes, you know, like always and never and. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. But people like S and you know, publishing houses and editors, they get pushed. They, People, people like to push the S. So there is, you know, is it the biggest? Is it the longest? Can we say that? I've definitely had people say, can we say da 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 da? Mm. Um, yeah. One of. <laughs> but One <was> of. The... <laughs> yeah. There's kind um, of an, exa an example that springs to mind um, uh, when uh, it was kind of controversial uh, Donald Trump when he was. Uh, well, before he ran for president, but it kind of came up after he started running, when after the 9-11 attacks, you know, he claimed that after the World Trade Center towers fell, that he owned the tallest building left in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, you'd think that'd be an easy thing to judge, but there's a lot of different standards for what is actually the tallest building. You get into like, <laughs> does it, whether or not the spire on top? Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's exactly. kind of like... You know, sometimes it's just not a matter of finding the information. It's competing, yeah. competing interpretations or definitions for what it is you're looking up. And that's yeah. why no rabbit holes, because sometimes you'll report this back to the writer and they're like, oh my God, no, 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 don't, don't spend any time on that. I'll just take it out. You know, like it's not that important to get it. Yeah. Right. But you do I mean, have to be very specific about, I mean, that's a great example. What's the tallest building? Is it the spire? Is it the tallest habitable floor? Yeah. You know, if you look at a sentence, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, well, you know, this is the molecular weight of titanium, you know, but, um, you know, or Professor Smith is at this university, but then there's a lot of other things that you have to sort of think about. And you just get used to thinking about words and terms and sentences in a slightly sort of, not, not a skeptical way, but just a, a questioning way of, you know, what are they actually saying here? And, you know, what do they actually want to say and seeing if that is the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's what is it you think you're saying? And what is it you're actually saying? And what is it you yeah. want to say? And, and then also like, does the reader care or know about the spiral, spiral <laughs> spire and the top habitable floor? Like, are we just missing the point that the person was trying to make, you know? And yeah. Yeah, uh, related to this, uh, I was wondering if there's any tools or any particular processes you use. Um, I know that when I do fact checking, often I rely on um, the footnote and endnote function in Microsoft Word. Uh, but is there anything in particular that you use to help you in the fact checking process? Um, you mean like a, an, a tool or an app? Yeah, like a tool or an app. I don't because if there were a tool, okay, so there are tools and apps and plugins and all that, but then I start thinking, it makes me a little nervous to have a robot or an unknown or murky entity um, pulling data for me, you know? It's like, well, oh, what, what is that app gonna do? And what's it going, what information will it exclude that maybe I would wanna see? And so I don't use anything like that. Um, I don't have any like little tech tricks that I can think of. But most, I mean, by far, the vast majority of um, annotations that I get are in footnotes or in notes. I know that um, in Microsoft Word, um, it's actually a lot easier than if you're fact checking on a PDF. 
but in, if you're fact checking a, a text document, um, simply highlighting what you've checked or just adding in things like okay or um, notes within the text, um, that works pretty well and, and quickly too. Mm -hmm. You don't want something that's so laborious to complete that you just sort of tie yourself down to doing the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, that makes a lot of sense. So we have maybe one or two minutes left. How do you all feel about one last one? Sure. Sure. So Michael Rogers asks, uh, with regards to public mistrust, do you think emphasis of process over outcome from data sources can help address public mistrust of recognizable data sources? I think the emphasis on process would be awesome. I'm wondering, is that, would that be encouraged by publications and by audiences across the board? I don't know, I don't know. I would love it. I, I see some conversations going on right now um, about process and I like that. <clears throat> I don't know, Dan, David. Um, I think that's a, that's a really tough thing to ask because what you're then doing is you're trying to, I mean, you have to sort of try and do it, but for instance, uh, climate change, you know, you have to sort of educate the public on what's the difference between say climate and weather and what's the difference between uh, data over a short time scale versus a long time scale. So you're really kind of trying to educate people on mathematics and statistics and um, how you use language and, and to unpack all of that to somebody who may just be like skimming through multiple websites in you know a few minutes, that's a that's a very tall order. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally, sure, that'd be great, but it's yeah. tough. <laughs> I I just like to be cynical, but you know, <laughs> one of the one of the most annoying reader comments we get, and it happens far too often, is when people write to complain. You know, I just want to know whether this is true or not. I don't want to have to read a bunch of stuff. So, so we want to layer that. You can print that out, put it on your wall. <laughs> just layer that with not just giving them the information, but the process behind it. You know, we're, we're losing all the people who don't read beyond the first two sentences anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it, make, it makes me go all the way back to primary school and, you, you know, What's happening in school? Are we being taught critical thinking adequately and logic and debate? I mean, yeah, there's only so much a writer and a reporter can do, right? To try to entice someone to learn about a subject and educate the film. Will's got to be there. You got to want to read about the process. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I actually tried it once approaching a fact check about something as you know, sort of writing it as a narrative of here are all the things I did to try and run this rumor down and find out if it was true or not. And, you know, we did get a lot of uh, compliments from readers about, you know, they enjoyed seeing how the process worked, but so <laughs> I don't think we could do it uh, other than as an occasional one-off, you know, without losing a lot of the audience, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, we're just about at time. I think we're actually a little over time. Uh, so I think that might need to be the last question we address tonight. Um, I want to say thank you to our panelists, to Emily, Dan, and David. You've been so kind to give us your time and to let us pick your brains about all this. Um, I'd really like to say thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, these have been some amazing questions, and I wish we had a little bit more time. There's so many good things that I just want to dive into. Um, but yeah, uh, so this has been the Northwest Science Writers Association's panel on fact checking and how to work as a fact checker and the, uh, the greater, bigger scope questions around fact checking. Um, if you would like to learn more about us, uh, we're at northwestscience.org, that's nwscience.org. Um, if anybody, you know, if you know of anybody who wanted to attend but couldn't, um, I believe this will be recorded. Um, and then other than that, uh, thanks everybody for attending. Um, yeah, 
uh, wait, uh, is there anything else that you would like to say before we uh, do a final sign off? Yeah. Thanks, James, on a great job and a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> Thank you very much for spending part of your evening with us. Have a great uh, night. Thanks, all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Stay Thanks. safe. Bye. 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 Bye